from the beginning. <laughs> well, I'll start. I'll start fresh with something. I need yeah. to share my screen. Yeah. I need to make this. Apologies. Is that Angela is telling me this? No. no. We have one person in the audience. <laughs> very important. I don't know. <laughs> but it's also what? Why resume share? The sharing also doesn't work. Okay, now it seems to work. Okay. Yeah. okay. Cut for where well, I have to cut the video. Yeah. So the 30th issue of uh, Footprint is dedicated to the philosophy of Bernard Stiegler, as I just mentioned. And uh, the interesting thing with Stiegler as a philosopher of technology is basically what he how he tries to think through our current times in terms of technology. And then also with a particular French word version where he distinguishes technology from techniques. So uh, his first book that we are also trying to foreground, let's say, in our discussion is Technics and Time, which of course is an, say, an allusion to Heidegger's being in time and how to basically rethink our being from the point of view of technology. And the interesting thing there is exactly how through his entire work, he constructs basically a network of concepts that help us think through this condition. You continue, you continue. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. And the central notion that he pursues in, in the book, Technics and Time, is this uh, interesting word of epiphylogenesis, by which he basically tries to highlight an evolution by means, uh, by evolution of the living, by means other than life. And if you basically try to understand what he's trying to picture, then it turns out to be a theory of the co-evolution with techniques or technical co-evolution. And that's, of course, also where the relationship to architecture comes in. No architecture as a cultural technology. What I want to do very briefly today now for, let's say, introducing what the, what the, why, why are we talking about this in relation to architecture is to understand where does this theory come from and what does this concept offer to us? And the first thing that I need to, let's say, make a little detour around is, let's say, the biological notion of epigenesis and epiphylogenesis that in this book, Techniques and Time are combined into, let's say, a new kind of theory. And very briefly, the distinction between epigenesis and phylogenesis would be one between development on the one hand and evolution on the other hand. And that, it really, does. technology doesn't like us today. <laughs> um, so the idea of epigenesis is a relatively old idea already that was coined in relation to something earlier that was called preformationism, where it was basically that people thought that every being is in a sense microscopic and then it just says it grows in scale, but it doesn't really develop, it just grows into like an adult form. And the more modern science has uh, progressed, of course, we have learned that that's not the case. No, it starts from a clump of cells that somehow divides and organizes itself. And at some point, something like life or a being emerges. And how does this process operate? No, nobody knows exactly like how is it that let's say all these kind of embryos basically start from the same type and then some end up being chickens, some end up being human or so, or even plants or you know what. So there is something in this process where there must be something that guides this process towards a final form. But what is it? And so this notion of epigenesis was coined by Conrad Waddington, who tried to understand that, okay, we start with a clump of cells, and then statistically, there is something that he calls an epigenetic landscape, where development statistically falls into one path. Now, of course, not that an, a chicken embryo ends up being a human, but let's say, what what kind of chicken is it? Like, when does gender occur? When do colors in certain things occur and so on. Now, in regards to the, it's genetically encoded, but then the epigenetic aspect is in a sense something where the environment determines how this process actually unfolds in the way that it is coded um, by genetics. 
And since the notion has been a little bit, let's say, defined so that people discriminate now between epigenesis in general and ontogenesis, which is more, let's say, the evolution of the being itself. And what Waddington already highlighted, if my computer wants to show this, is that somewhere under this landscape, there must be mechanisms, epigenetic mechanisms. And back then in 42, he didn't really know them so well, no, because let's say genetic sciences were just on the verge of, let's say, being uh, developed. But so there was something, let's say, pulling these kind of things in, in specific ways. And today we, of course, know much more about epigenetic mechanisms. We also know that the genome in itself isn't sufficient, uh, or sufficient for, let's say, determining the development. There's something along the DNA that's like these kind of histones uh, where certain processes of methylation actually activate or inactivate certain genes in the development. They switch them on and off, so they're like switches on, on the genome, and that's where the Greek epi on epigenome so you also have an epigenome that can also be influenced so for example that's where for example intergenerational trauma through starvation or uh, so become activated or why fishes uh, switch uh, sex by with specific water temperatures or so so that's in a sense where gene expression is switched on and switched off and so it's not that they necessarily encode it but you can i don't know exactly how to call it you have the software in here but then it's this way that the program runs basically when and where the program runs so that's the current status of epigenetic mechanisms in the same time biologists increasingly know that also cultural aspects have a certain influence on how this epigenome operates and uh, culture needs to be part of epigenetic mechanisms and that is exactly the idea that stiegler develops by first, in some sense, discriminating this kind of epigenesis, how it's the development of certain things, and how the development is re recapitulated in the differences that it makes in speciation. And speciation is phylogenesis. So the differences accumulate, in some sense, into different forms. The interesting thing about Stiegler is then that he argues that human evolution is specifically changed by the advent of techniques. And then he refers, of course, to anthropologists like the Roi Gouin or others that have argued how we evolve with tools, how our brain evolves with tools. Well, I write the uh, Guran's name because you say it in a very good French accent. Okay. But, uh, I don't know if the rest are going to figure it out. But it's in the sense the advent of tools we know has not only changed our relationship between our uh, dexterity and the brain or something, but it literally gives us certain things. The way that people were chewing sinews while knitting something changed our jaw so that we can end up speaking in contrast to other hominins. Um, so this needs to be accounted for in human evolution. What is this then? No, it's an environmental factor that's very interesting to figure out. But it's not necessarily like it's somewhere between technology and culture. You no, know, things that are usually very diametrically opposed in the way people conceive of them. But when we think about cultural technologies, then of course much more integrated. So anthropogenesis, he argues, is fundamentally shaped by these cultural technologies. And then the point that Stiegler tries to make is that actually we shouldn't uh, reduce that only to humans. Come on, please just show me the last slides. Yeah, so human evolution for Stiegler is but a special case of something that doesn't have a name yet. How we develop through adaptations of our environment, techniques. So, for example, we can use beaver dams as the same kind of thing where beavers adapt their environment and they evolve with these dams, like anthills, like bird nests, like Hydrothermal, uh, hydrothermal vents in the deep sea. So there's something more general of which the human evolution is just a part. And he tries to say that this evolution operates by means other than life, first of all. So this other kind of thing becomes part of how we do, how we evolve. And he then tries to situate this other factor in the organization of inorganic matter. So the organizations of the built environment. The funny thing is that Siegler only very late in his 
work also assumes architecture or the built environment as one of these inorganic organizations. And that's in a sense where we try to move forward with Stiegler's ideas and where we actually try to come up with, a, say, a, a theory from our perspective, what we can do with this kind of understanding. Because the interesting thing is, of course, what Stiegler argues is these organizations, they retain past events. Previous generations have adapted something. But then we inhabit these adaptations. So Darwin isn't correct anymore that we just adapt to an environment. We adapt to an adaptive environment. That we ourselves are exactly. So there is a weird recursive loop emerging where we adapt to our own adaptations. And this is what he calls a third kind of evolutionary memory, epiphylogenetic memory, that he argues couples genetic memory that is encoded in our DNA and epigenetic memory, which is accumulated over a lifetime, but as soon as the life form dies, it's lost. In the moment that I can write down my experiences into a book, this book becomes a technology with which I can transmit this epigenetic memory, which is very interesting because then we can learn from past experiences. Language is also part of that. And exactly also the built environment structures how older generations have lived or thought we should organize the environment. So there's something very interesting in this recursive loop where we inhabit a past adaptation and then we have to adopt or further adapt it. And that's, so to say, the interesting thing where he argues we actually are then creating artificial relationships where beings like us or city dwellers, for example, create their own niches. So in biology, there's this notion of niche construction. So we don't passively inhabit niches, but we create our own niches. And then that means basically that we also adapt to our own adaptations in these niche construction processes. And one of Andre's most famous uh, or favorite uh, quotes is then from who said it? Churchill. Churchill. No, Churchill. Like that, was Churchill. Yeah, we, we shape our cities, but then thereafter they shape us. And then we shape them based on how we are shaped. No, so that's this perfect, like this perfect uh, reciprocal relationship. And that's exactly. I have a question. Yeah. What is meant by exosomatic? Yes. Uh, it is, in a, some sense, if you think about here, that um, if you change. Your, if, if somebody changes the environment, um, Stiegler argues that you outsource that memory. If I write a book, I outsource my memory into the book. So he calls that ex-organization because it's all organized outside my body. And this outside my body is the exosomatic for Stiegler. And then ex-organization is basically Stiegler's con contraction for exosomatic organization. So it's an organization that is not a body. Normally you think of self-organizing in terms of bodies, but think about ex-organization ex would be how certain beings shape the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Like the city would be outside, outside your body. And he also makes this, like for the second part, he also makes this kind of implicit distinction where he understands the inorganic as still being organized. So he wants to avoid that the inorganic is not understood as organized. So he calls it the organological, which is like one of the further complexions uh, about it, or complexifications. So the interesting thing is then, let's say, what we're trying to think through within our more posthumanist vision also is that this is one part how technology and technicized environments basically shape us. And you can understand that this epiphylogenesis as uh, basically a form of becoming together with environments. And then of course the funny thing is that then Siegler is extremely hermeneutical in like this analysis also of let's say the more the history of technology is very androcentric, western centric and so on or eurocentric in its scope. So it would make sense to extend that theory a little bit with, let's say, for example, Donna Haraway's work, who does exactly the same kind of proposition in terms of sympoiesis or other 
thinkers that use the word um, allopoiesis. So it's basically where a system becomes something else than the system. And both of them basically means he proposes a notion of evolution, which is not autopoietic. So it's not about like a kind of a contained logic that generates itself, but it's actually the interesting thing how something is generated with other things and how it also therefore becomes different. And that's exactly in some sense that uh, where let's say we have invited our, uh, we have invited people to reflect on these kind of relations. Um, and we were actually very happy with, let's say, the diversity of uh, responses that we got from, let's say, deep dive analysis of Siegler's work, its relevance in general, its relevance for architecture, but also slight contestations that, let's say, help us to push, let's say, it a little bit in a different kind of context. I want to put just one diagram before we go to the content, because I think that because I'm triggered by this question of exosomatization, why is that an issue? Because this is incredibly important. Earlier, Bob showed the, the phylogenetic tree, mm. tree, mm. tree, I mean, the, the one that the, the speciation model. Uh, so you start from a, so you start from a something, a, a condition, you know, something that grows, and then it, it branches out into zebras and horses, and then into something else. But the, the thing is that anything that happens below the, beyond this point. It's always about branching out the difference. So you go to ever more different differences. Uh, but you never ever can't jump from one branch to another jump uh, uh, because you are somehow locked in the in, in terms of like path dependency. So it's like, like a firework, you know, it just goes out and out and out. When we're talking about the condition where the uh, memory is exosomatized, taken out of the body, you actually can. And this, this is what, why, why uh, Stigler is uh, talking about evolution by means other than life. If you are lived, if you live uh, and you're born into a city that precedes you uh, uh, with all its, its mechanisms, you could be, I mean, in terms of like, this diagram, which I'm, I'm, I'm constantly kind of drawing even more complex, it is possible for two branches to actually come, come back together. And, and, and in that sense, it, 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 you, you can, it's transspatial, even transtemporal, because you, you, you are not locked in, in, in a certain kind of unfolding speciation, you can, you can uh, in, a, in terms of a sandwich, you, you can now be uh, conditioned and get to condition the milieu that you, you, you grow in. You see, this, this is the exosomatic moment. The, the other, I can't think of anything in, in nature, like in, in, in terms of bio, biology or uh, Darwinian theory that would allow for, for this, uh, opportunity that we are basically uh, are benefiting from uh, ever since we decided to exosomatize, to take the first bone to hit something uh, when, when we took things out of the organs and turned them into something that now uh, not only that it is outside of us, but also concerns our affinity, becomes transgenerational. So it's, it's insane. I mean, it accelerates everything. Uh, so in that sense, we were, in this way, we were showing this wonderful moment of the cubics uh, policy where the, the bone is morphed into a spaceship, arguing that the spaceship and the bone, both exosomatized, are only different in kind, in, de in degree, not in kind. It's the same thing, the same idea of taking something uh, and, and, and uh, messing up with the mechanism of evolution itself. So this is something a new possibility. I mean, it's just like one specific way of looking at it, but you could also look at evolution and then say, you start with hydrogen and you start with oxygen and they come together into water to produce oxygen together with carbon and they produce carbon or like some sort of uh, uh, carbon oxide. And that basically at some point generates cells, but it also produces different types of cells. And then you have mitochondria with another kind of uh, larger bacteria and the larger bacteria eats the smaller bacteria, you end up with a nucleated cell and so on. So it's actually like that the tree of life is rather is the inverse of how we like to think about it. And that's in a sense this idea of symbiosis, where let's say, who am I right now? If I'm constituted mostly of water and then 40% uh, of my DNA is not mine, but from let's say the bacteria that populate my gut, so depend, who, who shape my mood, who, who make me survive. Who uh, is that you watch? The, who, who am I? Music that you listen to. No? And for example, in biology, you have then the idea of a holobiome. So on a hollow genome. So I'm not just my DNA. I contain DNA of like a billion different species. 
So, and they are all, let's say, relevant for making me function more or less. Uh, so, so in the sense, it is it's something about if you think about how also architecture is produced, then architecture is of course also produced from the combination of certain elements. So, this way of thinking how something develops is very close, even to the fact that, of course, you could say architecture doesn't develop like uh, a living entity. But you could think about the difference between development and evolution in terms of that every project is developed and the projects together accumulate into a certain evolution of architecture. So this distinction be between the epigenetic and the phylogenetic you also have within, let's say, our profession. You have that in our how our profession is actually speciating. What sort of function does architecture have in this kind of assemblage and so on? And therefore, we think it's the most adequate version to also think about history, for example. So if phylogenesis provides you with a different way of looking at histories, how things come together, how they shape certain things. And therefore, they also allow you to make distinctions as Siegler intended, for example, regarding technology. If architecture is a cultural technology, then in what components does it take place right now? So uh, the different types of evolutions that techniques have and that techniques like architecture have, you can think about what do they do to us? How are we employing them? How do we individuate with architecture or with certain other kinds of cultural technologies? And what actually, would have been otherwise? Exactly. The, I think one of the interesting thing is since uh, we try to get several contributors here today, uh, yeah. and unfortunately, uh, if we didn't manage due to various reasons, except for Stavros. <laughs> here. Yes, and we thought it would also be make sense. So I was trying to lead up the presentation towards this point where we talk about this kind of what I just mentioned with these different sorts of individuation. And what also Andre was mentioning here between, let's say, the cross connections in the branches, that's something that Stiegler also takes up from the work of Gilbert Simondon, which in Simondon's work is called transduction. So it's, let's say, the horizontal gene transfer that sometimes happens between different branches. And Simondon, of course, de develops this into an idea where it's not about individuation as such anymore, but what he calls trans-individuation. And Stavros, in his article, makes the point that the entire work of Stiegler is basically pointless if you don't try to understand how he uses Simon Long and how he tries to actually develop it further. So would you want to elaborate on that? You want to relate to stop now, that's what I want to ask. Okay. Yeah, I don't know which things I want to elaborate. I want to elaborate many stuff. <laughs> well, I don't know if I want to elaborate on that specific last part. I want to start from another part yeah. uh, that has to do with uh, it's a thing that we were discussing many times in our journey together with a colleague of ours, which also is having similar interest, and uh, that's a coca coda life, uh, which comes from this Timothean perspective. And I was thinking about it when you were showing the, the, the beaver, or you were giving the example of the beavers and the dam. And uh, I think this is a good point to clarify, because one might take it, if not clarified, one might take it as a, as, as, as a slightly reductionist approach to the one by Stigler or Simon Don or Guran, or many other guys and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, because they might say, well, okay, they just explain everything by means of, uh, of uh, technology, even if they have a broad understanding of technology. No, they don't explain everything by means of technology. They're even more radical than that. They say that it's only by a technology that the category we can call even animal, in the broad sense, human in the restricted sense, is produced. But in there, there is differences. So it's not just that we are all intervening into our environment from beavers to humans, and therefore we are all, let's say, more or less in the same pool. How we do that has different consequences in the production of that animal itself. There is a crucial difference, what Andre was implying, and also you, Bob, in what humans do as opposed to beavers and their dams, is that we, one way or another, either by writing it down, or by making it in the form of a story, or by making it in the form of a movie, or by making a song about it, we exteriorize our memories, and we also exteriorize in that sense our, uh, our desires as well. So we both exteriorize what has happened, and we also exteriorize and determine how can we think about what will happen. And this has a crucial difference between us and beavers or bees or mice. 
any bee or mice or beaver in a way they need to learn how is the phrase going to 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 build the, the, the wheel from scratch again to learn how to do the wheel from scratch again every time that they're born there is a lot of stuff of course there is stuff that are inherited quote unquote but there is also a lot of stuff most of the stuff that have to do with their environmental interactions that are learned again from scratch the fact that we don't need to do that creates a crucial radical difference in how humans one would say individuate, and then we go further on to speak about another complex term, which is transindividuation. I find one of the best entry points for Stigler, for anyone that's interested, a, a small article by a guy, Mark Hansen, which is uh, titled Bernard Stigler, a philosopher of desire. And he's trying to approach Stigler and his thought as essentially a philosophy of desire on how come we to want stuff. How do we want stuff and why do we want them that way? And he's making again the crucial point in there following Stigler, but it's because of all the memories we have experienced and all the memories we have offloaded that we come to want things in a specific way. To give you one last example, uh, if let's say you go and you meet your beloved one, okay, and uh, you are in there in the event itself, then you can start. I mean, I hope you, I hope you don't do that when you're actually meeting your beloved one. Yeah, 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 but I hope you don't do this process when you're actually meeting your beloved one. But anyway. In the moment you're there in a date, let's say like two days ago, for example, uh, you flush because you're you're enjoying it, okay? So your, your cheeks are red. This is your genetic memory already, registering the event that's going on in you and with you and for you, okay? That's why you flush. Your genes react to that. You start, uh, I don't know, whispering a song that you just make on the go or some lyrics you make on the go on your way home. That's the epigenetic part where you are allowing to offload, in a way, information in your environment about something that happened, but without exteriorizing it permanently or semi-permanently. You are not inscribing it anywhere. So in that sense, it might be even forgotten by you or by anyone that passed by you mm -hmm. at that moment. The crucial thing is if you go at home, you start writing about it. So you start writing a song down. Well, that's a poem or mm -hmm. whatever. That's what starts to branch out in the way that Andre was describing, okay? It means that I, 200 years later on, can come and read your poem about your amazing love moment in 1880, whatever, okay? It means that I can be influenced by how you thought back then, by what happened to you back then. It means that I also can start desiring in the way that you probably desired or in different ways of you, but only because this was possible due to the fact that you inscribed your memory somewhere else. This is something, long story short, and uh, then I give it back to you, that other animals don't do, we do, but we should not fall uh, victims in thinking that we do it because we are special. Mm. We are special, if anything, because we do that. So it's the other way around. Because of these technologies, yeah. we are humans. It's not because we're humans that we have the capacity to write or to exteriorize our memory. It's because luckily we happen to have that accident happening to us, that the category human, and also the category time, that's what Stigler says in Technics in Time, mm. were produced. I just want to complement uh, what you're saying, this idea of uh, theorizing something uh, in the form of, of, a, of a poem, which is to grammatize gram something that has an autonomy now. It doesn't depend you on, on any anymore on you. It's out there. Yeah. It's out there. Uh, when uh, Professor Boris, uh, Professor Gadri said that if a bee sees a field full of flowers, it can communicate it to another bee. But the bee that hasn't seen it cannot communicate it to the one that has not seen it. So in that sense, he says that uh, language as epigenetic technology can be only moved from the second to the third, both of whom have not seen the, the bee. Yeah. So you see that this is the difference. Uh, so that piece of technology uh, really makes sense in that sense. And the language is one, but uh, I mean, these things as well, here, yeah. is the exteriorization of a very specific problem that the person or some people might have had. I don't know how many thousand years ago, we would be how do we elevate the ground a bit off from the earth in order to sit slightly more comfortably? And it's called a chair. We call it a chair now. But besides how we call it, this thing is also an exteriorized memory. It's the memory of having to deal with the problem of the ground and how to elevate it. The same way you can extend that to many other architectural elements, like the way that Bob is sitting in there, the room we are in, the way it's arranged, how we do buildings, how, how we play. I mean, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's, it's not. In the sense, it will never be ours. Thank God. It's always something that is besides ourselves. 
And in that sense, it's also atemporal, I would say. It comes from nothing, it goes to nothing. Well, it's to me that the share is not going to be the one that's most of the is locked in his vital space. It produces always the same kind of thing. But somehow, maybe there was the memory of the first view about like the fish and putting something out there. Like, is that not potentially also maybe a less like, evolved and less complex version of that which you have it? Or Think about it. Compared to the chair example, but, uh, Think about it in this way the exosomatic is not necessarily an exteriorization of memory, but an exteriorization of behavior. And that is in some sense, uh, you could also say cities are shaped based on the movement, how what we do, no necessarily all our memory. Um, we make memories by moving around. The, the primary thing is that things are moving. And then based on the movement, the more you walk across, let's say a field, the more you get like the trails that then the more a path is walked, the more a path is walked. So now that they start to create these self-recursive loops where something contingent becomes encoded into something more permanent, a more permanent form. And that is in a sense, if you think about uh, how these things basically build up. So you could, for example, rather than the way you propose it, it's actually an analytical lens to trace it back. So it's not about figuring out when was the first beaver, but let's say you had like some sort of aquatic mammal that did something with fishing, which is an older technology. And how did that lead to the construction of dams to which then a species adapted recursively? Also, there is, I mean, not in the terms of Stigler or the words of Stigler. There's also the difference between instincts and institutions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You want to say something about it? Yeah, oh. yeah, but I have a question I want to ask. It was like, uh, so for me, it's just like a bee's action is more, activity is more like a, a fact. So it's like the immediate way things. But immediate. how, yeah, so how it can be transferred or inscribed into the memory, that is the, um, what's the unique point of the point, I mean, yeah. the distinction between something that instinct gratification, something that in period of gratification, you, you use more energy, matter, but eventually you, you get both Maybe. out of it. As you as in building a, a factory that produces shoes, so that everybody right. here can have, have a pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, this is the. I mean, are you sold or not? Not yet. The beaver could not make a dam for like three generations and then go back to the Yeah. Or leave a blueprint. When, when I see a beaver committee on inspecting dams, then I'm going to believe that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, because there's another point. I mean, what he was calling transindividuation, uh, Robert, also I would claim that it happens only in the past. It's, it's, it's the individuation that happens that individuates us as a collective and, and each one of us at the same time. So, so Using the, the this uh, mm -hmm. space in a particular way, plus individual space. But also, also even more than just using this space. Yeah. Using this space also for now. How many years are we in this faculty? Yeah. How many years does it exist? If using spaces to teach, let's say for 150 years, makes all the difference. And I mean, if it were not, we would build up the space. Then we would just destroy it all down the moment we're. Oh, in the forest, we have another... the latency for people to, or it maybe enhances that say epigenetic mechanisms to. Yeah, um, yeah, okay. There's no strange here, but uh, well, you know what I mean. So, like, I think it's it, he. It's a very Stiglerian question, and mm -hmm. um, a method that he uses to do that. That somebody also discussed it in here is what Stigler with by way of uh, Derrida calls pharmacology. So, a pharmacon is basically a gift. So, it can be both good and bad. And he would never say technology is good or technology is bad, but he says what, in what context is technology benefiting us and in what is it toxic? And he just uses this as a way to ask the question about technology. So what the question you have would be a perfect question to, to analyze, to make a research about through a Stiglerian lens, more than, let's say, me giving you an answer to it. Well, I think it's, it's important, if I heard you, well, we shouldn't uh, fetishize environment as something pristine, beautiful, and then become and spoil everything, you mm -hmm. know, technology. Uh, uh, because in this case, environment is produced and it has the capacity to, to produce, it's modulated. Yesterday in the class, I used this uh, 
what I consider to be the most convincing case so far where you had a chance to rescue animals who by the time, by, by now have adapted to the circumstances so that they live in, in polluted water. If you really could technologically clean all the waters, they, 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 they die. Because in the meantime, they, they have adapted. So there's no way of going back uh, uh, anymore. So this is what I think Bob also mentioned it uh, today in some other set up, uh, setting that the problem is not going back or forth. I mean, yeah, yeah I, uh, I think there, there was a moment yeah, where you know what I agree on. Time is not reversible. Uh, time is only reversible in, uh, in, in laboratory conditions, uh, in closed systems. Let's say, I mean, some of them, I don't know, they have some of them in there, but they do physics experiments. Yeah, in there, for the sake of the experiment, time is reversible, but in life, it's sometimes not reversible. So, yeah, that's not the point. The point is that other people that, uh, like uh, Yuk Hui, Yuk Hui is a Chinese Hong Kong coming from a philosopher that is uh, influenced by Stigler a lot. And he is also quite popular, I would say, lately, more than uh, philosophy, also in architecture. Uh, that's the point that he's making. Uh, but the, the, the issue is not about the reversibility of amount of time, which is not reversible. It's about the, the fact that, for various reasons, which are not technological only, but some of them are economical, financial, let's, let's, let's mm -hmm. discuss that later. Technology is operating in a homogenizing way rather than in a diversifying way. No. It used to be for uh, almost thousands of years that technology was in plural, was technologies, and it was always diversifying. It was always heterogenizing. So over people were doing things in another way, and they might even exchange, let's say, approaches on how they were doing it differently. And this was in its own right pushing things forward. For various reasons, which is another meeting and topic and discussion, it seems that technology would like to impose at least the dominant technologies would like to impose themselves as the one and only way of doing stuff. So the problem with social media, for example, is not that they're online or, or, or anything else, it's that they're homogenizing. Everyone is, they're allowing you to do stuff with them in a very limited way, and everyone ends up doing the same stuff with them. That's the issue with uh, social media mostly. It's not that they're uh, spamming attention or not. I mean, that's not the problem. It's that we all are big. That's why I like the Hansen article in Stigler as a philosopher of desire. We all start to desire the same way, you know? I mean, by using the technologies in a homogenizing way, we start also to desire in a homogenized way. Mm -hmm. And that's very much problematic. Yeah, if you mentioned it. So, so you is basically saying, if everybody agrees, and I suppose there wouldn't anybody would be in this room, they didn't agree that biodiversity is uh, important. relatively important. And he says it's as important as techno diversity in the sense that if we finally get out of of these kind of eco chambers where everything becomes more of the same, you buy a book and then the Amazon tells you people like you buy these books as if you wanted to be more like you. I mean, uh, this is the, that's the, that's the, the condition of it. But it's not, I mean, it's Amazon, it's a, the movies you watch, the book series, the music you listen, and it makes sense because the more that would be attuned supposedly to you, the more profitable it would be for the one or the ones that are making parts of these music and books and, um, and, and movies, etc. But that has never been the point. It's a very recent thing. I mean, there is people like uh, Mackenzie Ward, but uh, in the book, what's the name of the book? The Vectoralism, right? Yeah, vectoralism. In that book, he's claiming actually that what we are in, and it's a technologically produced, let's say, status, is not capitalism anymore. It's something different than that. Because it's not about accumulating capital in any form. It's about, let's say, directing differently whatever we can call as digitally produced information. So, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, who controls what comes to the end of the uh, address, let's say, list in Amazon, and how this, for example, diverts also towards Bobby or not, or to a list of music that might be later on listening to someone. This is the one that's making actually the money and, and kind of guiding how the whole thing operates. Not the one that supposedly in the old school way accumulates uh, well, in the basement, that's not uh, how it works. Feudalist, capitalist, vector, vectoralist. Vectoralist, and uh, I mean, other people that I even disagree with, like most things like Varoufakis, uh, they were uh, they were they were making a very nice claim. I mean, the way that the markets operate nowadays, again, in the Glarian way, as Bobby was mentioning, technologically produced, the way that they are operating, would be the same as you would go out in Delft and you would walk around, and in the center of Delft, one person would own uh, would own everything. Mm. I mean, literally, I mean, you go and you buy or you listen or you watch stuff today. And it's so, it's such an oligopoly, let's say, it's such, 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 a, such a homogenized, non diverse, not that heterogeneous way of consuming, but it's the same as you will walk in Delft in the mid 60s, mm. and it could be one person owning the whole of the Delft market. It's not crazy. Yeah. I think there's also, um, I think there's like, uh, some of your focus on shaping that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We can, uh, if you had two Amazons that are exactly the same, but one gives you other options, and one gives you 
Like the thing would find you somebody you know, <laughs> maybe nasty person somewhere pulling all the, the, the things it's us. But yeah. you want to you want to analyze that you say it's Amazon software. So actually, you know, we would choose that exactly something else. But the thing is we're discussing with the vendors just before we wanna be lazy. Okay, we are geared to being lazy. I mean, the fact, what Amazon is doing is automating the shopping process. There's nothing essentially wrong with that. The same way that the toilet class is automating a process that used to take 20 minutes 300 years ago. When you were going to the toilet, you would need to go and pick up your stuff, then you would need to put them in a bucket, which you would need to fill with water from the river, you would need to go back to the river. So this was taking 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. We have a class that automates that in two seconds. The same way Amazon is automating the shopping process. There's not a problem with the automation itself. How it's done, that's a question we can open though. And I think the problem is, I shut up now. Right? No, no, no. I think the problem is what Simon Don is pointing and Stigler picked up and it was his last uh, words in a way for the last years at least. We need to become literate. We need to become knowledgeable of how these things operate and how they work. The more illiterate we are technically, the more we are easier victims to succumb to any kind of needs and desires of others. Okay. Yes. Still have a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe you partly answered the question uh, just now, uh, but I was wondering what was so wrong with the homogeneity of, uh, or the homogenizing of uh, social media, for example. Isn't that what's called culture in some other words? Yeah, no, I think that's a, that it's it's not an answer. It's not an easy answerable thing. But let's say it has something to do with. Uh, I mean, you talked about this distinction. To go towards techno diversity. Mm -hmm. The point is basically that there has always been a lot of different techniques. We would call them cosmo techniques, how we construct our worlds you know, through technologies. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing, I think, or the, the warning that Stiegler basically puts to us is with the diminishing of these earlier techno diversities, also comes the diminishing of what others would call epistemo diversity, different forms of knowing about the world. Uh, which also creates an impoverishing about different types of subjectivities. Others call that no diversity. So what kind of subjects are we? So if we all succumb to this one type, then the homogenize, homogenization, like what does it do? Does it make us say, con consumers who only choose between different pre-made options or so? Uh, or like even the way that algorithms try to trick you in like certain behaviors where you do, let's say unpaid labor for data collection and I don't know what like a pattern recognition and so on and how we internalize that so that we're actually unlearning to be aware of what it does with us where we're heading towards and I think the interesting thing about let's say it's basically a call if you understand that tech it's not that this modernist believes that at some point in the 20th century technology started to have an impact on us but from the moment hominins develop to humans, technology shapes us. Then the question becomes, how does it shape us? And then the question becomes, do we like how it's currently shaping us? I was, I was thinking earlier you advertised uh, that the issue that is uh, between 28, your issue and ours is uh, the one on populism. There's a moment, if you want to check it out, some of the answers are there. For example, uh, Prince Charles now the king, the British king used to believe, I mean, and he was very vocal about it, that uh, the 18th century architecture, in uh, Georgian, is the architecture. Nature. There's no need to go anywhere else. If you want like a, a bank, you have a, a perfect type for it. If you want, uh, you know, everything is qualified and we are fine with it. And, and it's, it's a legitimate position, but of course, uh, I mean, I, I, I strongly disagree on this. You know? uh, the recent, more recently, uh, uh, Trump had very similar ideas. Uh, that for public uh, architecture, there should be like a code agreed upon by everybody. And why experiment? Because you know we have reached a certain level of sophistication, and we, we should uh, agree and, and uh, come to uh, really like a consensus around this issue. You know that, that that's that's the, the real stake I think beyond theory. And come to you to decide. We who teach architecture, we should go home. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the interesting thing you said yesterday was uh, during the lecture was that if you read something which uh, everything is already uh, familiar to, yes, yes. it becomes a very boring text. Yes. So that's what I think. Yes. 
was thinking because uh, I, I easily get bored of my, myself because I know exactly what I'm thinking. This is why you kind of pickle yourself if you try. Yeah. And if you, if you, if you pickle yourself and you're laughing, it's getting really. Good. <laughs> 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 okay, <bye. laughs> I'm, I'm trying to pickle myself in that sense. So, so that I'm not, uh, Yes, last, last, last question. Uh, yeah. uh, I was just wondering if, it, if this is not just a matter of scale in terms of common, common genetization. Like it has happened since the beginning of human time uh, mm -hmm. with the tribes and then countries and mm -hmm. civilizations. And now with globalization, we see this globalization as a, at, at a global scale. But isn't it the same thing? Okay. Just like at a bigger scale, but isn't it just? The same process that has been happening ever since the beginning of human time and uh, joining into communities and then bigger communities. But, but do you think if there's any good measure about Skira, you know, that the fact that somebody mounts a force and has ways of manipulating uh, so that it goes in a, in a particular direction? Uh, I don't think so, because we have three things now, three things coming together that are not meant to be together. They're not of the same, you know, you know that, that the Skira itself made of uh, what is it? Metal no, I don't think. Yeah. I think, I think for the sake of that, I think that the question is whether, I mean, whether the now global community, the way it's produced, it's normal, you're saying, because it's always been about producing communities. That's yeah. what you're saying. Okay. Think, yeah. think about it this way. I think it's not something that Stiegler personally is very good at theorizing, but I think then we need like heavy doses of Jose Baidotti or uh, Sylvia Winter, uh, Catherine Yusuf, or so on, let's say feminist decolonial scholars that have a different view of the human. <laughs> And the point is, in this global upscaling, the question is, if we only select one cosmotechnic, then whose cosmotechnic is that? What sort of human is that promoting? Yes. And that's, in a sense, the danger, in some sense, in the eradication of all these other types of knowledges, diversities, techniques, and so on. Of course, through colonialism, and these specific ways of thinking have been imposed on a global scale. And so it's not about the scaling itself, but in like what kind of, what form, what politics, what system, yeah. what knowledge, what technologies are, let's say, imposed for whom, whom does it benefit and whom is it disindividuating? Because the majority in the world is, let's say, undergoing huge processes of disindividuating through the effects that this creates. Yeah. Oh, no, it could have been otherwise. I mean, still, because we made it seem inevitable. And so, well, I yes, but I don't think so. I mean, every, you know, in moment in time, there, there could have been other options, uh, uh, and then I think it would have ended up with a very radically different uh, because it's an open system. Uh, in fact. What I wanted to say, even more, more conservative uh, viewpoint than what Robert uh, just said, is that uh, there is a pragmatic, pragmatic that's how he was called himself, philosopher, don't view it in the states that he was saying that publics don't exist by themselves, publics, human collectives, and communities they don't exist by themselves, they come together on the basis of a problem that they share. And when, when once they might have dealt with that problem, they might even be solved. No. Like the same way we share a problem, we should be in the meeting today and how we can discuss about that topic, but we're all a bit interested, probably, or I don't know, whatever reason have to come. We share that, we form a public in that sense, we form a collective for one hour, and then we will be solved. I'm not sure what exactly or who and how can we think of, but the global problem or a set of problems that we might be sharing, and I'm not sure whether we are all sharing them in the same way. With the same intentions from the same position that's what probably robert was saying let's say about how the dominant viewpoint on the human is uh, is produced itself makes a crucial difference on how that global collective supposedly comes together or not i don't think however as Andrew was saying that it's a natural thing or necessary to have any any collective for that matter it's, it's it takes time and energy and workforce to produce it so it should be very meticulously done and with care and maybe I'd like to, to wrap up these things. I want to quickly go through our contributions or like a few of them to just show you, let's say, where you would find the most interesting for you. And the first one is actually that we have a uh, very nice uh, commissioned article from uh, Claire Colbrock, uh, who actually does the thing that we're always saying, is let's say applying, uh, putting Stigler a little bit through like a kind of feminist lens and actually asking like, what does epiphylogenesis then demand of us, uh, specifically in rethinking the human or like anthropogenesis? Who's who's evolving into what? What kind of being? Exactly. And so to say, like also challenging what is the problem of epiphylogenesis there? So it's a like very, uh, it's a thought, it's a think piece in some sense that makes us uh, think about these kind of relationships a little bit uh, from a different type of lens than maybe Stiegler himself would have uh, 
uh, promoted. And then let's say a very interesting piece is then that we have who uh, somebody who takes this idea of evolution from a posthumanist lens and applies that to the evolution of uh, forests in uh, West Northern Africa, like these kind of redwood forests. So people evolve with these kind of uh, trees and the way that they adapt to them rather to cities and how plants also communicate with each other and how they basically form this interesting relationship. And uh, then we already uh, mentioned, let's say, the, the central piece in, in uh, a kind of a ping pong uh, of, of thoughts. Uh, to go a little bit deeper into this relationship, how Siegler's work depends on, on uh, Simon Don's rethinking of technology. Also what Star Wars mentioned in how we, the, the literacy, the technological literacy that we should have, how that is basically also kind of... Maybe just one, your, your subtitle would have been, uh, it is not what uh, architects learn from Simon Don, but what is it that Simon Don can learn from architects? Okay. Yes. Around because we are manipulating these uh, environments, so there is something to, to, to teach. To teach mm -hmm. And then the last one that I want to mention is basically a text from an uh, ex-student from this faculty, Satara Norani, who is now uh, a researcher at the New Institute, where she is uh, uh, heading the Collecting Otherwise uh, department. And she has contributed basically a kind of a, a queer decolonial critique also. What does it mean in specific uh, terms of the sort of memory and how it is archived? And she's kind of reflecting on what memory is archived, by whom, what does it mean, and so on. So it's like also very interesting. And this line saying, well, no, this is not a type or anything. Like, no, no, not, I, had, the text. Yeah. I had, I had, let's say, questions in there and I forgot to no, no, erase no, this one. But the text itself, how the text itself, it's also with visible comments and stuff like that. I am right, exactly. Right, that's what I wanted to say. So, okay. like, it's, it's a, basically, it's a kind of an uh, experiment in trying to trace her own sources and ways of thinking you know, and things there. A little bit color coded, and they're also uh, combined with archival material uh, from our own work. So it's also a very interesting thing. But that said, feel free to grab a copy and yeah. give us give us your questions whenever you have any. Also, yeah. so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.